to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. To the prophet Jonah, God said, Arise, go to that great city Nineveh, and preach to it the message that I tell you. Jonah chapter 3, verse number 2. Welcome to our study of the minor prophets, and especially today, the study of Jonah. Today's lesson is being brought to you by the Churches of Christ worldwide and is overseen by the Central Church of Christ in McMinnville, Tennessee. We're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. As always, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or other lessons, or maybe you've got a Bible question, you can visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From that website, we also have free media available as well as study outlines and various Bible study material that no doubt would be helpful to you in your study of the Scriptures. One of the more well-known prophets is the prophet Jonah. Almost anyone who is familiar with the Bible is mindful of and remembers the story of Jonah being swallowed up by that great fish and then spit up on the shores and goes to Nineveh to preach God's message. But besides that story, which was a great Bible class story, what do we really know about Jonah and his message and how that impacted people then? Apart from being mentioned in the book of Jonah, Jonah is also described in Scripture as a prophet of comfort to the northern kingdom of Israel during the reign of Jeroboam II, which was about 790 to 750 B.C. He's mentioned in Scripture doing that in 2 Kings chapter 14, verses 25 through 27. That being true, he would then be a, a contemporary, working at the same time as prophets like Amos or Hosea. What's interesting about Jonah is that his name means dove. He's often thought of, when we think of Jonah, Jonah is thought of as a, a super patriot, but a rather reluctant prophet in going to preach the message of God. Now, let's consider this question. Why was it that Jonah was so reluctant to go speak to the people of Nineveh? Was he just prejudiced by nature, or is there more going on in the background? Well, as you might imagine, there was a lot more in the background than sometimes we consider. For example, Nineveh was the capital city of the nation of Assyria. Now, Assyria was the nation that God used to punish His people in 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 7 and 8. In fact, God spoke of their king, Assyria's king, as the rod of my anger against Israel. Isaiah chapter 10, verse number 5. Assyria eventually carried God's people away captive around the year 721 B.C. Thus, the Israelites and the Assyrians were arch enemies and they had a great resentment and hatred for one another. It wasn't as though Jonah just decided, I don't like the Assyrians, I don't like the Ninevites. There was war, there was devastation, there was death that occurred in Israel. Very likely some of Jonah's own friends, maybe his family, people he knew, had been destroyed as God used Assyria to try to bring, try to bring his people back. And so Jonah knew very well how evil Assyria was, even though they were used by God. And this is the reason that Jonah disliked them so much. In thinking about Jonah, though, there are several keys that will help us to better understand this book. What is Jonah about? Jonah, if we were to put a key word with this book, the major, major message, overarching message would be repentance. God is crying out to Nineveh, people who have souls, people whom God is concerned about, and Jonah's message is 
repent or destruction is coming. And thus a powerful message of repentance as well. Jonah chapter 1 verse number 2, kind of the key verse. God says, I've seen the wickedness of the Ninevites. It, it is great and it's come up before me. Therefore, I want you to go and preach to them. Key phrase, Jonah chapter 3 verse 8. Let every man, let everyone turn from his evil way. That's what God wants. God wants people. Like in Joel chapter 2, verse number 13, God wants men to rend their hearts, not just their garments. The same is the idea found in Jonah chapter 3, verse number 8. And so a key message that correlates so well with the nature of God and, and really the message of the New Testament is this. God wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth and how true that is as well in the book of Jonah. One of the things that makes Jonah so unique and so memorable to us is that the book of Jonah is filled with multiple miracles, multiple supernatural divine interventions by the hand of God. For example, in Jonah chapter 1 verse 4, God creates what is known as a mighty tempest. That is, a great storm came upon the ocean. Something we might think of like a hurricane all of a sudden occurred. How did that happen? The miracle of God created that. And then, when they toss Jonah in the ocean, there is all of a sudden a calm. Miracle occurred by the hand of God. Another supernatural intervention here, miracle is, God, the Bible says, created a great fish to swallow Jonah. That's probably one of the most amazing things, and everybody remembers Jonah being in the belly of that great fish. And then, of course, along with that, there is Jonah's deliverance from that fish. God calls that fish to make its way to the seashore and to vomit Jonah up on the beach. The gourd was prepared by God. In Jonah chapter 4 verse 6, another great miracle. And then not only did God prepare gourd, but another miracle of God, God prepared a worm to destroy that shade tree. And then of course God sent a scorching east wind to torment Jonah. And so this book is so memorable, so wonderful to think about because you see so much of the hand of God and His power throughout this book. Now just for a moment, I want to give you an outline of the book of Jonah. And you may have heard this. It's been around. It's nothing new. But it is a very memorable way to remember the book of Jonah. That outline is this. In chapter 1, we see Jonah running from God. That is, God says in Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach to that city. Jonah gets on a ship and goes the opposite way. He's running from God. In chapter 2, when Jonah comes to his senses and begins to repent and pray, Jonah is now running back to God. And so running from God, running to God. Chapter 3, Jonah finally gets the idea right. God says, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Preach the message I preach you. Jonah from that beach goes into the city and he's running with God. He's preaching the message of God. Then good things happen. There is a remarkable turn in repentance among the Ninevites and Jonah gets angry about it in chapter 4. He's now running ahead of God. And so from God, chapter 1, to God, chapter 2, with God, chapter 3, and in his prejudice, he's now running ahead of God in Jonah, chapter 4. And so a very memorable way to think about the book of Jonah and its powerful lessons for us. I want to talk about for just a minute some of the living messages of the book of Jonah. What is Jonah all about really and, and how does that apply to us today? One of the more remarkable lessons that applies so practically to Christians today from the book of Jonah is we cannot run from our responsibility to God. Notice what the Bible says in Jonah chapter 1 verse number 3. Scripture says, But Jonah arose to flee 
to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into the city to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Here God said, I want you to go to Nineveh. He gets on a ship and goes the opposite way. How did that work out for Jonah? Not very well. Jonah ends up in the belly of the well, being vomited up on the ocean, on the seaside, and there is convinced, I need to do what God says. The principle is this. We can't run from the responsibilities God's given us. For example, one of those responsibilities is to be a light in the world. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I can't run from that responsibility. I can't say, I want to be a Christian, but I don't want to be a light. The two go hand in hand. Whether I realize it or not, I am making some type of influence and impact on other people. I need to embrace that idea and be the best light that I can. I can't run from the responsibility to do good unto all men. Galatians 6 verse 10, especially those of the household of faith. I need to help the needy and the poor and those who are hurting and the widows and the orphans. I either am doing it or I'm not. And I know deep down whether I really have that right with God. I can't run from the responsibility to evangelize. Jesus said, go into all the world. Preach the gospel unto every creature. I can't say, I don't want to do that and just avoid it or do something else. Friend, I've got to take up that responsibility and really do and really be what God wants me to be. You know, another very practical lesson from the book of Jonah is this. Jonah ended up paying the fare or paying the price for his decision. And people who live in sin will pay the price as well. In Jonah chapter 1 verse 3, we understand that Jonah ended up paying his own way. He bought his own ticket to get on that ship to get away from God. How did paying the price to escape from God work out? Well, he ultimately paid the price all right. When they took him up and cast him into the sea and he ended up in the bottom belly of that well, Jonah realized what the real price from trying to escape from God is. And friend, let's realize this. There is indeed a price to be paid for one's sinful actions. Romans 6.23 says this, The wages, the, the price of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. One thing you can be sure of, and Jonah surely came to realize this, be sure your sins will find you out. Numbers chapter 32, verse number 23. Galatians 6 verse 7 says, Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. There's the principle of sowing and reaping. If I sow sin, I'm going to reap the consequences of that. And so let's not think we can escape from the consequences of sin. The Bible says in Hebrews 4 verse number 13, that there is no creature hidden from his God's sight. All things are open and naked before the eyes of him with whom we must give an account. You know, another very practical lesson that we learn is that a person's life can often be in great turmoil when he's not doing the will of God. You see this in Jonah, verses 4 through 16. Jonah's on that ship, he's sleeping, and yet there becomes this great storm. They begin to throw cargo off. They don't want to have to uh, crash or they don't want to be busted up in the sea. They begin to throw cargo off. It gets worse. What do they do? They begin to pray their gods. And, and, and then they encourage everyone else to. And they finally realize Jonah's the reason for this great turmoil. His life being in turmoil and not doing the will of God brought great turmoil. Friend, our lives will always be in great turmoil. We'll always be in that, that storm being pulled apart as it were, until we decide, I really need to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. You know, when we think about Jonah, there are a couple of other practical messages that, that really jump out in this book. And, and when you find in chapter 2 that Jonah is now he goes to the bottom, they cast him in, he goes into the sea, and that great fish swallows him. Jonah is a great example of prayer and just how powerful it is. 
in the bottom of that whale, in the belly of that fish, Jonah begins now to pray to God. He begins to contemplate his decision and his heart begins to change and he prays to God a prayer of repentance and deliverance and prayer even from the belly of that great fish in the bottom of the ocean had powerful results. That fish cast Jonah up on the beach. He was indeed saved. But here's the lesson. Let's never ever underestimate the value of prayer. Men ought always to pray, Jesus said and never lose heart. Luke 18, 1. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. James chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore we must come, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4, 16. We need to pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse number 17. And so let's realize what a wonderful blessing it is that we can receive help and have communication with the Father. You know, another lesson that we learn that is very practical from this book is that salvation, if it's going to come, is indeed of the Lord. I want you to notice Jonah chapter 2, Verse number 9, and what Jonah here says. From that belly of the fish, Jonah prays this. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. If Jonah was going to be saved, how is it going to occur? Well, he wasn't going to get out of the belly of that great fish by his own doing. Wasn't any other source going to save him. He knew if he was going to be saved, it would only be of the Lord. Friend, that same principle is so true as it relates, spiritually speaking, to man's need to be saved from sin. The Bible says in John 3, 16, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How will men be saved? By God. Acts 4 verses 11 and 12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9. That's why He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. You know, another very wonderful, encouraging lesson God gives to Jonah and that applies so directly to us is found in Jonah chapter 3, verse number 2. Notice what this verse says. God says to Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. What would save Nineveh? What is it God wanted Jonah? Jonah, I want you to go in there and tell him. No, Jonah, I want you to teach and say what I've told you. New King, King James says, preach the preaching that I bid you. That's the idea. We need to preach what God says. Found so often in the New Testament, this same principle for Christians. Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2. Speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. Preach the whole counsel of God. Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. Men and women are encouraged to receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save their souls. Where's the power in the gospel? Romans 1, verse 16. Where's that saving power? The Word of God is living and powerful. Hebrews 4, verse 12. And so our opinions, our ideas, feel-good social messages, that's not what people need. Men and women today, just as in the days of Jonah, need the powerful preaching of the gospel and how God is truly going to give them His grace and mercy through Jesus Christ. Another very important lesson that is found in the book of Jonah is that God does expect and command all men everywhere to repent. Jonah chapter 3, 
verses 3 through 9. I want to read these verses to you, and I want you to listen carefully to the message Jonah gives. The Bible says in Jonah 3, verse 3, So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent, and Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh. He arose from his throne, laid aside his robe, covered himself in sackcloth and sat in ashes. He caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and the nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth let, and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? What was Jonah's message? You've got 40 days to get right with God, change your life, or Nineveh will cease to exist. The message was a very powerful and relevant message of repentance. Friend, that same message is the cry of the New Testament. Acts 17, verses 30 and 31, In the idolatrous city of Athens, Paul cried out, These times of ignorance God once overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Luke chapter 13, verse 3, Jesus said, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Acts 3 verse 19, the idea is repent and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. Rend your hearts, not your garments. Joel chapter 2 verse number 13. Now, what happens when people repent? Well, here's the wonderful message. The long-suffering and pity of God is given to people who truly repent. I love the words of Jonah chapter 3, verse number 10. In the midst of this difficult situation, a reluctant prophet, a people steeped in idolatry, who God wants to save, and yet they've only got 40 days. Listen to Jonah 3, verse 10. The Bible says, Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from bringing from the disaster that He said He would bring upon them, and He did not do it. What do I learn about God? God's willing to forgive. God's a, a long-suffering God, merciful God, and God has pity on those who will repent. Lamentations 3, verses 20 and 21 tells us, through the Lord's mercies, we are not destroyed. We're not uh, burned up because His 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 love and His mercy is new every morning. God is indeed a merciful and loving God. We learn this in the New Testament as well. Do you remember Second Peter three verse nine? The Lord's not slow concerning His promises, as some count slowness. Slowness, tardiness on God's part is not the problem. He's long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come. To repentance. Now, what happened in this great city? Probably one of the greatest responses to any sermon ever, the people changed their lives. And yet, to that response, Jonah had a very serious case of prejudice. Notice Jonah chapter 4, verse number 1. The Bible says, when they repented, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Jonah has probably one of the greatest responses by numbers ever recorded in the Bible. And what does he do to that? He gets angry when they change their ways. Now remember, the background of this is because many of these people had been involved and their families and some of their kinfolk likely had been involved in the killing, the murder the devastation that occurred in Israel. And yet, instead of being thankful that people are changing their ways or repenting, Jonah gets angry. Let's not be prejudiced like Jonah. Jonah was angry because he knew God would forgive. Chapter 4, verse 2, that's exactly what Jonah says. And so now God gets Jonah's attention. 
Jonah goes out of the city. God creates this tree to shade him. Then a, a worm eats that tree and causes it to die. And then this east wind comes and torments Jonah. And Jonah was thankful for the tree, which there are a lot of other people who are more important than that tree, and angry when it, but he didn't care anything about these people. And so God says, Jonah, in essence, don't you have your priorities wrong? Illustrated from this is the power and love of God and how we need to have that same compassion for other people as well. Friend, the message of Jonah that applies so practically today is indeed a message of repentance. How long do we have? It's not 40 days. Might be more, might be less. I don't know. But I do know this. What is your life? It is but a vapor. Appears for a little while, then it vanishes away. I know time's short. I know we don't have long on this earth. And friend, the point of the lesson is this. Now is the time to get right with God. Today is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1 and 2. Are you really living? Friend, are you really living the way God wants you to? We ask you out of kindness and love. Is your life right with God? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? If you've never become a Christian, please do so today. Are you willing to hear the word? Romans 10, verse 17. Would you believe? that Jesus is God's Son, John 8, 24. Are you willing to repent of things in your life that are not right and turn to God? Luke chapter 13, verse 3. Would you make that great confession? I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Acts 8, verse 37 through 39. And to contact the blood of Jesus, would you be immersed in water? Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. If you've never obeyed the gospel, we encourage you to. And friend, if you are a Christian and your life is not being lived right, don't delay. Make it right. Make sure that you're right with God so that God's love and mercy can always be the covering over us. May God bless you as we study His Word together and as we obey His will. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.